Well, um, how, how are we going to understand the composition of structure? We got to see a lot of, you know, we got to see a lot of data. We got to see a lot of observations to formulate these patterns. Because if I just tell you what the pattern is, right, you know, you, you have no, no basis. So if I told you the average, uh, if I told you the average bond energy of a carbon carbon bond is 430, whatever, 440 kilojoules per mole, you know, okay, so now you know the average, but do you know, you know, what, what is the weakest carbon carbon bond? What's the strongest? And what's the range of carbon carbon bond energy that's observed in nature? Do you have any idea? Are all carbon carbon bonds 434, whatever it is, kilojoules per mole? I, actually, I don't have the number memorized. Or is there a range? If there's a range, how big is the range? You know, this type of stuff. And so um, I could give, go ahead and get, tell you these average types things, but you know, it, it's much better if you see a lot and then you can make your own, you know. Uh, summaries for this. And so our approach again is a mix of theory and descriptive. Of course, theory is very appealing because theory means that all you have to know is the theory. You don't have to memorize. Descriptive chemistry is memorization. You know, there, there are some people uh, who say, oh yeah, we gotta get rid of descriptive chemistry because we can figure out things theoretically, but that's wrong. Uh, you're gonna be able to see. And so theory, what is the theory? Oh, quantum mechanics. Descriptive or just facts, like, uh, you know, what the HCl reacts with. And so, um, well, it, it, we, could, uh, we could ask this question. This is a similar question I asked the other day. Is HCl a gas, liquid, or solid at room temperature? What are you going to use, theory? Can you tell me theoretically or prove to me theoretically that HCl is a gas at room temperature in one atmosphere? No. You, you, there's no way you could tell me that. There's no way you could prove to me, unless, unless you're, you're more advanced than and you've done quantum mechanics a lot, quantum mechanics, and you're good at math, um, or anyway, you know, people on, people use computers to do mathematics. So, and so here, obviously, descriptive, descriptive. Yeah, we just memorized. You memorized it, right? Well, some people, yeah, like like I said yesterday, some people say, well, there's no point in memorizing that either. Well, if there's no point in memorizing that either, then you're never going to learn patterns, right? You know, if you don't have a, a bunch of numbers or whatever in your head, you know, digesting, how are you going to recognize any pattern? It's like all those ions that we put up there. Did you see the pattern initially? Maybe not, but after you look at it long enough, you start to break down the pattern. And if you have it memorized, that makes pattern recognition much, not that you memorize all the numbers, you know, but there's certain data you have to have memorized. And to understand chemical reactivity, you need to, to have some stuff memorized. You know, and usually the stuff that we want to memorize are the extremes, you know, on one end, on the other end, you know. This is the, this is the situation oftentimes, you know, somebody spends three hours looking at one problem. They're only seeing one tree in the forest. They don't know how far the forest extends one way or the other. They're just, they just spent three hours looking at one tree. And so they haven't seen any breadth of trees. So they don't know what kinds of trees, how many different kinds of trees, this kind of stuff, right? But if you go to the extremes and you say, okay, here's the range, and then you see the between, then you get a much better feeling for the forest, you know, how it, how it extends. And so that's my point. But, um, you know, we use uh, properties uh, to determine composition and structure, vice versa. So sometimes we just know the properties and we can get insights into the composition and structure from the properties. Sometimes we know the composition and structure and we get insights from the properties. So we go either way, you know, from properties. Uh, like it, we might have an unknown liquid. This is a chem 1B type scenario here. We have an unknown liquid here. Well, you, you know what it is, but if this were an unknown cl clear colorless liquid, would you drink it? Looks like water, right? But how do you know what its composition is? You know, in fact, it, it, you shouldn't drink it because it says uh, industrial water, do not drink here, right? And so you, you don't drink it, but, you know, but 
Well, then how do we know what's safe to drink and what's not safe to drink? Well, we measure all the properties. Once we measure enough properties, you know, water boils this, et cetera, and then, then, um, then we can figure it out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to get through it. So, um, I already spent some time talking about this, but uh, we have uh, a list of different kinds of reactions that you probably encountered here. But let me um, illustrate some of the problems because I told you there are problems you know, that I have with this list. And so the list is not comprehensive. What if you have this, like this, this first HCl plus HNO3 plus gold? You know, hydrochloric plus, what's HNO3? Nitric acid plus gold, what happens? Can you use some of those patterns that you saw earlier to, to solve what's gonna happen here? No. And so it, it, it's not comprehensive enough. You know, we want something more general that we can use to predict a wider breadth of reactions. This is a very famous reaction. Do you know what this reaction is called? HCl, a combination of HCl and HNO3, the mixture of these two acids is called aqua regia. You know, aqua regia is like royal or water. And the special property of aqua regia is it dissolves gold. Why does it dissolve gold? Well, we have two types of acids here. When I look at HCl, HCl is what I call mineral acid. You know, it's a redox property, it's just standard acid redox properties. Whereas HNO3 is a special acid. HNO3 is called an oxidizing acid. And that's based on the structure and the composition of those two acids. Those two acids behave quite a bit differently, even though they're both strong acids. And so as far as acid properties go, they're, they're the same. HCl, HNO3 neutralizes the same basis. But as far as redox properties go, they're totally different, redox. Uh, also, it's confusing. I mean, if you look, both of these are combination reactions, right? A plus B yields C. A plus B yields C. But if you look at these two, these two are totally different in terms of driving force. You know, the first one is just a combustion reaction here, or a combination reaction. And the second one is what we call a Lewis acid base reaction. And but they, you know, you might call them both combinations, but they're you know completely different. And so in Chem Four, they made you memorize all these subcategories: element plus element combination, element plus compound combination, compound plus compound combination. Now this is getting too much. And so we just uh, change it. And so here are three based on driving force. For our um, driving forces, you know, um, at least for this, the Chem 1A part, we're looking for formation of more thermodynamically stable products with less stable reactants. And so going from less stable to more stable. I'm gonna stop it. And... Uh, descriptive, what types of things do we look for in stability? Actually, I'll stop now. Let's stop now. We'll take a break. Oh. Uh, well, let me go just for a little bit. Uh, descriptive, what types of things will clue you in that it's more stable? Well, what we talked about even earlier, if we're going from sodium metal to sodium ion, are we going from less stable to more stable or more stable to less stable? Sodium metal as a reactant to sodium ion as a product. Are we increasing stability or decreasing stability? Increasing stability, it's going lower in energy and becoming more stable. So those, those types of things we look for, but those are types of things are the things we look for in redox reactions. For metathesis and acid-base reactions, we look for things like precipitation and, you know, precipitates are usually stable bonding, forming crystals, that type of stuff. That's descriptive. Let's just jump predicting reactions here. 
All right, when we predict the reactions, we, we're going to keep a couple of assumptions in mind, you know, because we're just doing this from memory, you know, memorizing these patterns, right? And therefore, it, it's not always 100% uh, accurate. You know, we could be fooled sometimes because, so we got to make some base assumptions. Otherwise, if everything's variable, then we have to account for all those factors that can impact the reaction. And so one of the basic assumptions is the concentrations are going to be kept at one molar, and the gases are going to be kept at one atmosphere or one bar. You've seen this before. You know, this is called what? When the concentrations are one molar and the gases are one atmosphere or one bar, that's called standard... Hmm? Not standard. STP is um, STP is zero uh, degrees C in one atmosphere. It's a little bit different. You've seen this before. Let me just uh, jar your memory. This little superscript here. What does that little superscript mean? Delta H not. Delta H superscript zero. What does that little zero or superscript mean? What does that tell you? Versus non-standard conditions. This is called the standard. Oops. This is called the standard enthalpy change. Delta H not. This is standard. Well, what does standard mean? Does that mean STP? No. What does it mean? Versus this delta H. This is non-standard. And so we have a standard delta H and a non-standard delta H. What's the difference? This is the different, this is called standard thermodynamic conditions, not, you know, STP. This is standard thermodynamic. So we're going to just assume standard thermodynamic conditions as a rule. Not that. Uh, all right, but if we, um, if, for extremely low or extremely high concentrations of pressures may require compensation for. So for, for this reaction, this is double replacement. HCl plus silver nitrate yields silver chloride PBT plus HNO3. Driving force for this is precipitation of silver chloride. But um, at very dilute concentrations, when you mix HCl and silver nitrate, we get no reaction. There's no reaction, even though precipitate should form. And that's because the concentrations have an impact on reactivity. And so at very dilute, nothing happens. Um, when we look at standard conditions, silver chloride plus HNO3 yields no reaction. Because um, why is there no reaction? When, when you do chemical reactions, I want you to show me why there's no reaction. And so let's take a look at this one. This is a double replacement reaction as well. And so this one shouldn't um, be too difficult, I think. Silver chloride plus HNO3 yields no reaction. Well, what are the predicted products of this double replacement? We'll just do double replacement first. But, you know, just because we look at double replacement doesn't mean a acid-base or redox reaction can't occur. It can occur. And so we have to consider all three. But looking at double replacement, why do we expect no reaction here for silver chloride and nitrate? Well, what are the products? In a double replacement reaction, the products would be silver nitrate and HCl. Is there a driving force for this? Well, what are the driving forces for double replacement reactions? One, precipitation. So um, all nitrates are soluble. Acids, group one, are soluble. So there's no precipitate. What's another driving force for double replacement? OK, uh, formation of water, but we, ha we have to get a little bit more in depth. It's not just water. Water is, what we, this is a difficult, weak, um, what we call weak acid, very weak. And so what we say is this. We say we're going from a stronger acid to weaker acid. So what's a stronger acid, HNO3 or HCl?
What's a stronger acid, HNO3 or HCl? In water. HNO3 or HCl? What's a stronger acid in water? Well, um, this is the acid strength. So acid strength is increasing as we go up. And so it looks like, uh, what's this called, HCl4? Perchloric acid's at the top, and then HCl, and then HNO3. So it looks as if, it looks as if HCl is a stronger acid, right? Uh, but is it? No, because you guys know the leveling effect of strong acids? Have you heard of the leveling effect of strong acids? Should be talked about in Chem 1A. The leveling effect of strong acids. Does anybody, uh, does that ring a bell for anybody? No? All right, I, I, then I need to uh, talk about that. Let me just talk about that briefly. So it looks like we're going from a weaker acid to a stronger acid. A stronger acid, is it more stable or less stable? Stronger acids. Are they more stable or less stable? Less stable. Stronger acids are less stable. But this is wrong because of something called the leveling effect. And what does it mean to be a stronger acid? It means that the proton is lost more readily. It's easier to pluck the proton off the acid, the H plus, right? That's what it means to be a stronger acid. Well, in water, water is a plenty powerful enough base. And so one thing about HNO3, HNO3 versus HCl, which one will water have an easier time plucking the proton off? HCl. It'll have an easier time plucking the proton off to form hydronium, right? Because uh, H plus, the proton plus water makes hydronium, and we're left with chloride. Have you seen a reaction like this? So this is what happens. Uh, and so here, the HCl AQ will react with water to form H3O plus AQ and Cl minus AQ. Pretty soon I get tired of writing AQ, so I'm going to leave all the AQs blank, but I'm going to write the other ones like liquid, solid, gas. So it's blank. But the situation is, even though it's easier to pluck the proton off HCl, it's still easy to pluck the proton off HNO3 because HNO3 is a strong acid. And so water has no problem plucking off the proton. In fact, both of these are called strong electrolytes because they both hydrate, this is called hydrolysis, or they both ionize 100%. And so we expect 100% reaction here. This is 100% reaction. So which one generates more hydronium? You know, one mole of HNO3 or one mole of HCl? Which one generates more hydronium? They generate the exact same amount of hydronium, that, well, you know, for the most part. Therefore, they're equal. There's a tie. And so this, this ranking is based on like gas phase, you know, how easy is it to plug. But one thing that all the strong acids have is they have uh, the leveling effect. They're all equal in strength in water except for H2SO4. H2SO4 will generate a little bit more hydronium because it is a diprotic acid versus a monoprotic acid. You guys have memorized the strong acids, right? How many strong acids have you memorized? Seven. Are there more than seven strong acids? True or false? 
There are seven strong acids, and that's it. There are no more strong acids beyond seven. True or false? False, you know. Uh, there are plenty. Um, there are things called super acids, which are even stronger than these. Uh, they're so unstable, they have to be uh, contained a certain way. Okay. And so, uh, what about strong bases? Tell me what the strong bases are, and how many strong bases do you know? So seven strong acids, all the seven strong acids, for the most part, we're going to treat them equal in water. So if there's a competition, which one's stronger, they're going to be the same in water, right? That's a leveling effect. The leveling effect also occurs for strong bases. We're going to treat the strong bases pretty comparably, except for one of them. What are the strong bases? Sodium hydroxide. What else? Potassium hydroxide. Is that it? Calcium hydroxide. Barium hydroxide. How about magnesium hydroxide? Is magnesium hydroxide a strong base or is that a weak base? Magnesium hydroxide. Let's say, uh, you know, I went to the shelf and um, they were out of milk and magnesia, magnesium hydroxide, right? But there is some drain cleaner, which is sodium hydroxide. Can I substitute the drain cleaner, sodium hydroxide, for the milk and magnesia? Because sodium hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide, they're both hydroxides. Strong bases. Is that a good, no, no, obviously you're not gonna eat the drain cleaner. Uh, for uh, upset stomach. M yeah, milk and magnesia is okay to drink, right? Magnesium hydroxide is okay to drink, but sodium hydroxide is not. Why? Aren't they also, metal hydroxides are strong bases, aren't they? So I better not drink the magnesium hydroxide, too. You look at milk and magnesia as magnesium hydroxide. Stay away from that stuff. Right? No, it's fine to drink milk and magnesia. You're not going to die. But if you drink sodium hydroxide, you're going to die, right? Why? What's the difference? The difference is due to structure. And the thing is, can you use quantum mechanics to predict that? Uh, quantum mechanics, is, I'm going to predict this quantum, I don't have to memorize this kind of stuff because I'm just going to predict it using quantum mechanics or Google it. No, you, you got to learn some extremes, otherwise you have no, no way to put things in context. You know, if somebody asks you, oh, you know, I just ran out, no more magnesium hydroxide, can I use the sodium hydroxide? Well, you have nothing to place in context if you have nothing memorized. No. You need some basic knowledge to talk about anything. You know? uh, well, anyway, let's uh, let's take a break here. You know what we'll do is we'll just take one extended break here. Let's go for uh, let's start again at eleven. How about that? <laughs>